All right, well, let's have the sermon slide up there. We're going to talk about today about uh, the real Christmas. And we've been looking at the purpose of Christmas. You know, we're enjoying a lot of things during this season. Uh, we're not enjoying some things during this season. Uh, last night, uh, my wife said uh, to go down Signal Butte and to meet her at Cole's. But, but the, don't go into the Walmart parking lot. Don't go into that exit. She said she saw several almost accidents down there. But to go down further and, and enter in, and, and I did that, and that was, that was good. I went down further on Signal Butte and entered in. And, and just a tip, that's a better way to get to Walmart and Kohl's. If you just go on down past that, that's one of the most worst engineered intersection I've seen. It's just awful. Everything trying to get out of one place. So go down a little bit further, and it will take away some of the stress of Christmas. But we're enjoying also a lot of things at this time of the year. But we all know that those things are just a recognition of the real thing, and that's the real Christmas. I, I praise God for, for um, um, uh, uh, Charlie Brown's Christmas, that it's still being used and shown on television because there in that pageant, they read the passage of Scripture that this verse comes from that we see right up here on the screen. This is the real Christmas. And she will give birth to her firstborn, a son. She will wrap him in cloths and place him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. That's the real Christmas. And the closer I get to that and what it means, the more real it is in my life. And the more real help and the more real encouragement and the more real strength I get for my daily life. And so this morning, we're just going to spend some time looking at and talking about the real Christmas. My prayer for you and my prayer for, for me is that because of that choice, that God will give you some real strength, some real hope, some real encouragement during this season by being here today. Often Christmas is a time that we are busier than any other time of the year. And we don't have time to stop and to pause and to wonder at the nativity set and, and to stare at the wonder of the babe in the manger. But that's what we're going to do this morning. We're just going to slow down. We're going to get closer to the manger. We're going to get on our tippy toes and we're going to look into it and we're going to stare at wonder at the babe in the manger. But that's but that's what we're going to do, but we're going to look even beyond that and what he means in your life and in my life. See, Jesus, when he was born, was given the name Jesus. The angel said, you shall name him Jesus, and Jesus means salvation. It means God wants to rescue us from the worst of life and for the best of life. He wants to rescue us from the worst of life and he wants to rescue us for the best of life. But to really understand what Jesus wants to do, it's helpful for us to understand his names. A guy by the name of Isaiah, about, about uh, uh, 400 years, 700 years before, um, before Jesus was born, he told us what his name would be. And we read this in the book of Isaiah, and he prophesied this. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now, I know many of us have memorized it in the King James. It says, uh, Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is the New American Standard Version. We're going to look at that today. But I want to focus on the four words right there in the middle, Mighty God and Eternal Father. In those four words are two names, you and I, and there are, there are some things that we can see that can make this Christmas more real. And here's the four things already up there. We First of all, we see that he is the mighty God. And in that, take your sermon notes out, you want to write that, we see his power in the manger. Now, when we say mighty, uh, that, that word means strength in battle. It means prevailing over the toughest of circumstances. That's the kind of power God wants to give to you and to me. 
Now let's face it, face it, most of the time when we think about power, we don't think about a baby unless we're changing their diaper. <laughs> when we think of power, we think of other things. We think of military power. We think of fuel power. We think of political power, uh, weightlifting power, uh, electrical power. We think of a lot of different things when power is. But, but the greatest power, the greatest power that ever came into this world was in the form of a baby. It was Jesus. He was and is the greatest power that ever came into this world. And a new strength was born, and a strength to win the toughest of battles. So here's the question. What's your toughest battle right now? What are you struggling with? What is the problem in your life? What's the toughest battle you're facing? Is it some type of relationship? And it's not going the way you want it to go. Is it a circumstance that just isn't turning out the way you were hoping it turn out? Is it some temptation that you keep saying yes to instead of saying no to? Is it some opportunity that you're not sure if you're up to that opportunity? What is the greatest battle you're facing right now, right here, at this point? God wants to say to you, I have power available to you, no matter what that problem, that temptation, that circumstance, that battle is, I have power for you. What type of power? Well, that first Christmas, it was the power of God coming upon a virgin to have the Son of God. The angel told Mary when she inquired on how this was going to happen, the angel said to Mary, next slide, the angel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will cover you. That was them. Well, what about for you and me today? That was Mary. What about, what about us? Can God still work in our lives in that way, in a, in a powerful way? I'm glad you asked the question. Ephesians answers that question for us. And it says, with God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. The kind of power we're talking about, it's much. It's much more. It's much, much more than you can think or imagine or dream. We looked last week that we, we talked about the dime. Now God's spirit dwells within me. And, and, I, and we looked at the quarter, and we looked at the quarter, and the quarter reminds us, does anybody remember what the quarter reminds us? Thank you, somebody. Spiritual what? Spiritual growth. Well, what does the Q stand for spiritual growth? Remember the farmer went out, and some on the, some on the rocks, some on the path, some among the weeds, and a fourth of it he threw on the good soil, and that produced a harvest, 190, 60 times what was sown. God wants to grow in us. He wants us to grow and develop beyond our wildest dreams and imaginations, okay? The penny reminds us of the past, and my past has been forgiven. The dime reminds me of, I, I, I'm sorry, nickel. Nickel reminds me of now, God's spirit in me. The dime reminds me of determined destiny. I have a place in heaven. And the quarter reminds me of spiritual growth. I can grow beyond my wildest dreams and expectations. And how? Through his spirit working within us. God wants to work and God wants to do what's best in your life. And he wants to release his spirit. Well, how do we do that? How do we get that? Well, how many of you, can I see your hands, might have a, some type of cell phone? Let me see your hands. <laughs> Almost all of us have some type of cell phone, don't we? Okay, for how many of you, you could get by a whole day without charging your phone? Let me see. See your phones. Okay. How many could get by two days? How many could get by three days? How many could get by by four days? Ah, there we got the flip phone people there. And five days a week, yeah. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, praise the Lord for flip phones. Yeah. Okay. They only work if we keep them charged up. Now, we need that in our lives. We need to be charged up. But coming to church once a week, that helps, right? 
It helps. But I tell you, if I charge my phone up once a week, none of you are going to be able to call me the other six days. It's not going to happen. I have to charge my phone every day. I have to, actually, I got a better, extra battery. I throw a battery in, uh, tw I use, go through two batteries every day. I just throw another battery in and go on my way. I, I, have to, I have to keep those batteries charged up. And I don't just do it once a day. I do it throughout the day. And it's the same way with us. Even having our devotions, even reading the scripture, even having a, t a quiet time in prayer, isn't even good enough just one time. I mean, how many of you, be honest, charge your phone more than once a day? Let me see your hands. Okay, we got some honest people. I know some of you guys do more than that. Okay, we have to, some of you live with your phone plugged in. I've seen you at the airports. <laughs> I've seen you all gathered around the little electrical socket fighting over who's going to get to plug that in. Okay, we have to be connected to the source. We have to be connected to God. And the best way to do it is by reminding ourselves, saying, God, I need your help here. Uh, God, wow, thank you for that. Wow, that's a beautiful sunset, Lord. Thank you for the beauty. Uh, wow, God, thank you that you put taste buds in my mouth that I can enjoy, enjoy all 31 flavors of Baskin Robbins. And I'm going to try it out right now. We could be grateful to God. We could, we could call upon him. We can, we can confess. Confession is not only confessing sins or faults, but confessing a need. Lord, I need you. I need your help. I need, I need you right, right now. When it comes to God's great power, there's many ways we experience it. But one of the ways is, is a surprising way that we experience God's power. Here's what it says in Colossians 1.11. God will strengthen you with his own great power so that you will not give up when troubles come, but you will be... <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> you. You'll be patient. I don't know about you, but sometimes I want to run away when problems come. I want to go find that perfect church. <laughs> and guess what? The moment I walk in, it won't be anymore, Right? And here's the truth, too. The moment you walk into that perfect church, it won't be perfect either. Because there's no such thing as a perfect church. There's no such thing as a perfect family. There's no such thing as, I mean, we, we talk about dysfunctional families. Fa friends, we're all dysfunctional, okay? I stopped trying to figure you guys out. You know why? Because I can't figure myself out. So why am I going to try to spend time figuring you out, okay? I, I can't do it. I can't figure my own self out. So, so there's no such thing as a, as a perfect church. And we want to sometimes run away from our troubles. We want to get away from it. We don't want to face it. But God says, I will give you power. That you can face that battle. You can face that challenge. You can face that relationship problem. You don't have to run away from it. I will give you power to not only face it, but to be patient in it. Now, I need that type of power because I'm not usually patient. Huh? How about you? I need that type of power so that I can face the things that God, that God allows to come my way so I can face it with his power. A lot of times we think, we think um, that, that what, is, what is showing God's power is, is that great that great person that's serving God and you know uh, Billy Graham wow look at all the power and we see him on television or we see some great person of of the faith you know sometimes I think it's the things that are not seen where no one sees it but you and God and God has given you power to be obedient God has given you power to be patient in that circumstance you see God's equations are not like this world's the greatest are the least of these jesus said and the least are the greatest and so when he gives you power just to do the right thing to be the right type of person it's his power working in you so i place a, a, a spot in your notes that you can write down this this christmas i need strength too it might be a relationship it might be a circumstance. 
It might be a conversation. I need strength for this conversation. It might be a feeling about yourself. I need strength to, I need strength to know that God loves me. We talked about that in our, our, uh, our, our 40 days of, of discovering what on earth am I here for. That the first thing is we got to receive God's love. And this Christmas time, I need to know that God loves me, that God's not mad at me, but God is mad about me. That God is not against me, but God is for me. He is the mighty God. But I not, I not only need to see the power that's in the manger, I need to see the glory that's in the manger. I need to see the glory in the manger. The world is always seeing God's glory, the Bible says. You see it back in the Old Testament where, where the Israelites, they crossed over the Red Sea and, and, and it split and, and, and they walked on, dry, on dry, uh, dry ground. I can imagine if I was one of those little kids I can imagine walking, and here's this wall of water. And I, I could just see, see them just sprinkling, you know, the water, hitting that water, and, and, and it kind of goes off. And maybe seeing a fish in there. Wouldn't, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that have been something? And having the pillar of fire uh, by night and the, and, the, and the cloud by day and, and the following, all that. We see God's power throughout the Old Testament. But you know what? God's power is also demonstrated here. In, in Romans chapter 1, it says that through God's created um, uh, creation, we see the glory of God. You just go out, especially out here in Arizona, you go out in some areas, uh, in, Grand, in Gold Canyon, they don't, you can't have lights out on the streets and stuff like that. So you go out in the desert and you look up and you see the vastness of, of the sky and you see the vastness of God's creation. And you just marvel. You just there's something in us that wants to worship. There's something in us that that wants to be connected to something bigger. Uh, Psalm Psalm uh, uh, Exodus 15. After they came out of the Red Sea, uh, they uh, they wrote this: "Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders?" But we can see God's glory too, and we read this in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. But we can easily miss the glory of God. Christmas comes around every year, and we recognize that God came in this world every year. But like too many nuts in the Christmas fudge this year, we get confused with the little things. So it's worth for us to just take a few minutes together for you and I to focus on the fact that God came into this world at Christmas. A baby in a manger is God wrapped in human flesh. The creator, the sustainer, the ruler over everything, over everyone. Look at your thumbprint. He made that. He formed and fashioned and fingerprinted you. That is the God that came in this world at Christmas. Hebrews 1, 3 says, God's Son shines out with God's glory, and all that God's Son is and does marks him as God. Jesus is God. And he came into this world and was born as a baby. Now, this blows us our, our, our scientific minds away. How do you fit God into a baby? It's like trying to put the Pacific Ocean or all the oceans of the world in an eight-ounce cup. How do you do that? I don't know. I can't explain it. And I'm so glad I can't because if I could explain it, we have a very puny God. But our, my God and your God is above our thoughts and our imagination. And he did something wonderful here. But the one way I can maybe be attempt to explain how God did this is with the word humility. Humility. I don't know if you watched uh, any of uh, George, uh, George Sr. Bush's uh, memorials and funeral um, uh, messages, but one of the uh, former senators uh, from uh, Wyoming, he said, he said that uh, former George H.W. George Bush, he walked on the, on the road of humility in Washington, D.C., and on that road there's not very much traffic. 
<laughs> I thought that was pretty good. But our God did. Humility. Matter of fact, what was read this morning by Ralph in Philippians, it said he humbled himself and became a man and humbled himself even to the point of death and death on a cross. And the writer was explicit to say, not just death, but death on a cross, because those who are shamed and those who are guilty and, and, and those who are humiliated were put on the cross. And the Romans knew how to do all of that so very, very, very well. Someone wrote this about the baby in the manger being God. He who is the creator became a creature. He who is eternal allowed himself to be bound by time. He whom the heavens can't contain, get this, was enclosed in a woman's womb. He who is clothed in majesty was born in a cattle trough. He who is sovereign God became dependent on a human man and woman for his food and clothing. He who had spoken the whole world and galaxies into existence had to be dependent upon baby cries to communicate. The God of the universe became a baby. That's the glory of God. You know, some people think it's narrow-minded to be a Christian. No. It takes a great mind and a great faith. Not narrow, but a great open mind to be able to take in and believe this Christmas story. It's not narrow-mindedness, folks. You have a great mind when you are open to the creator of this universe. That God will come in the world and that he will come in the world and he cared enough to come in this world for you and for me. Maybe that is a challenging thought for you. Maybe, maybe you're here today and maybe you don't know Christ or maybe you don't, uh, haven't believed in all of this. And, and I'm glad you're here and keep investigating. But be real and be honest with God and say, God, reveal yourself to me. God, make yourself known to me. And I encourage you to pursue the truth and not what you might read on the Internet. Because if you haven't figured out by now, everything on the Internet is not true. <laughs> Emmanuel, that's another name for Jesus. Jesus' name at Christmas, it means God with us. And he wants to let you know that he's with you. He understands what it's like to grow. He understands what it's like to be weary. He understands what it's like to suffer. He understands what, it like, what it's like to be misunderstood. He understands what it's like to be hurt. He understands what it's like to have successes and victories. He understands what it's like to have failure. He understands what it's like to have pain. He understands. But when you think about the glory and the things that we think about in our culture as glorious, the really big screen kind of moments, they're a little different than this. We know every one of us that, that we're in a celebrity-driven culture. I think it's great to enjoy sports. I enjoy sports. I think it's great to, to go to a movie and, 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 and watch a, a good movie. But why is it that people tend to not only just enjoy the sport or the movie, but they move on and they want to know everything about that athlete. They want to even buy that, that jersey of that athlete and wear that, 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 athlete's, that athlete's number. Uh, they, they want to know everything about this celebrity and they'll watch uh, shows that gives us, you know, the inside scoop about this celebrity and, and who, who he or she uh, loves now and who, who they're going to divorce now, and, and, and all of that. We, we, here's the right reason why we do that, is because we want to be connected to something bigger than ourselves. We want to connect ourselves to something bigger than us. We want to, we want to root for a team that's winning, and a lot of times you see when there's a team that's doing well, everybody kind of gravitates to that team and say, you know, I'm a San Francisco 49er fan. 
No, nobody, nobody's gravitating to that team, are they? <laughs> I remember years ago when the Seattle Seahawks were, were doing so well. Our, our, everybody becomes Seattle Seahawks fans. You know, we, we gravitate. You know, when the Diamondbacks won the, won the World Series, you know, everybody wanted to be, we're, we're become Diamondback fans. We like to gravitate to something bigger than us. And here's the, here's the, here's the point. If you don't make God your wow, if you don't make God your glory, you will gravitate to something else that's not God. You will worship something else that's not God. We want to worship God. We want him to be our focus and our love, and we want to give him our adoration. There's nothing wrong with sports, nothing wrong with movies, nothing wrong with celebrities or athletes, but don't make them your idol. Don't make them your American idol. Make God your God, your one and only God. So write this down in your outline. This Christmas, I need a bigger perspective on what? On a problem? Guess what? The problem may be bigger than you, but it's not bigger than God. You need a bigger perspective on, 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 on about yourself, about someone else. How about a situation in our world today? I need a bigger perspective on politics. And the bigger perspective is, and it comes from this passage, that his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and the governments shall be upon his shoulders. And I'm looking forward to Jesus being our ruler and our king, and there's no more politics. None of that. I need a bigger perspective that he's going to make all things right. Amen? So you may be facing a problem now, but God is bigger than your problem. He is the mighty God. You see the power in the manger. You see the glory in the manger. But you also see a third thing. You can write this down. You see hope in that manger. The eternal hope that's in the manger. When it comes to hope, just like power and glory, we have our ideas what what gives us and makes hope for us. A lot of different ideas. What are some of the things that we hope in? Just speak it out. What are some things we hope in? Money, stock market, a car, a job. <laughs> Air conditioner, yes, or the heater when it gets cold. I'm glad, I'm glad none of you said the lottery because it's better for you to just put the money in the offering and use it for God's glory than to pay a self-inflicted tax. All kinds of hopes. Here's the deal when it comes to hope. When you put your hope in something that goes up and down like the stock market, then your hope is going to go up and down. When you put your hope in something that's not going to last, what's going to happen to your hope? It's not going to last. But if you put your hope in something that is eternal, your hope is going to last forever and ever. Hope came in this world. Jesus wants to give my, my hope. And Jesus says, I want to give my hope into your life. And Christmas says that hope is more than some sentimental wish. I hope it happens. I hope it happens. It says it's a certainty. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, The yes to all God's promises is in Christ. The yes. There are over 7,000 promises in the Bible. We have a promise um, a document that's on our app that has all these promises. Maybe not all 7,000 of them, but a bunch of them. And when you need something or when you're facing something or when you're facing a difficulty or sickness or illness or when you're facing a decision, you can look at, you can take that app and you can look at the, what the Bible says about these things and you can find hope. And the answer to all those promises in the scriptures are yes in Christ. Now you may be saying this. Well, I'm not seeing a bunch of yeses in my life right now. I'm seeing a bunch of no's. I see a lot of circumstances are not working out. I got a lot of problems. Well, how do you see hope when you have a problem? How do you keep hope when you're in the middle of a problem? Here's the amazing thing. That God can work hope 
right in the midst of the problem. Here's what it says about this in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. We also have what? With our troubles. When was the last time you had joy with your troubles? We also have joy with our troubles because we know that these troubles produce, what's that word again? Ah. You wonder why you have a bunch of troubles in your life? Maybe because you and I aren't patient the way God wants us to be patient. So I think a great way to get less trouble and have God to move on to the next thing he wants to teach us is to develop patience. Because we know that these troubles produce patience. And patience produce character. There's a bunch of characters in this service. And character produces hope. That's how God gives us hope right in the midst of the problem that this is going to be used for my character development because the only thing I could take with me to heaven is my character. I can't take anything else. And to become like Jesus is the only thing that I can take with myself to heaven. So, well, some of you say, well, I'm stuck on the first one, the patience one. I've got problems and I don't feel patient. I feel impatient. So how am I going to even get started on this? Good question. God has an answer for that too in this next verse. It says, the scriptures gives us patience and encouragement so that we can have hope. The scriptures. So get into God's word. Learn God's word. Use that Bible app. If you don't know how to get to that Bible app, see one of us, and we'll help you with that. Get into God's Word, because the Scripture is what gives us patience and encouragement so we can have hope. In the midst of your difficulties, it's God's Word. So write this down. How about you at this Christmas? Where do you need to trust Him? This Christmas, I need to trust God, um, because that's where hope comes from, trusting God in the difficult times. What situation do you need to trust God with? What person do you need to trust God with? If you're worried about, about writing down a name, just draw an arrow to the person right next to you, okay? Or put their initials. What feeling do you need to trust to have to, to trust God to trust God with? This Christmas I need to trust. He's the mighty God, the eternal Father. I can see his power and glory and hope. That's in the manger, but there's a fourth thing I want us to see this morning. I want to see the love that's in the manger. His love for me. He is the eternal father. He's not your dad. A lot of you did not have good fathers. He's not that. He's the eternal father. Eternal in his love for you. Everlasting in his love for you. Unswavering in his love for you. You are the apple of his eye. You are the pearl of great price. He loves you. You are the reason he sent Jesus into the world. He gave up his one and only son for you. He's done everything necessary to demonstrate and to show his love for you. You ask, God, how much do, I, how much do you love me? And he stretched out his, his hands and said, I love you this much. And he died on a cross. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. He loves you. See the love in the manger. But here's the thing. You have to accept it. You have to receive it. You have, he's a gentleman. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will open and opens the door. I will come in and eat with him and he with me. He's not going to open the door. You have to open the door. You have to trust him and say, Okay, I don't understand it all, God, but I want to receive your love. I don't understand it, and, and I haven't received it. And I've, I've asked you to forgive me my sins, but still there's this barrier there because we understand that you can send a message around the world in one second, but it takes so long of a time to go from here to here. And God, will you send, I know that you love me up here, but I need to know it down here. And will you make up the difference? And will you come from here to hear. See the love that's in the manger. We know this verse. This next slide. Let's read it together. It's not in the King James. It's the New Century Version. 
It will be a little bit different, but let's read it together. And read it like if this is the first time you've ever heard this verse. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him may not be lost but have eternal life. That is incredible. This next verse, and I already talked about it, is this. Nothing in all creation will ever, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in your notes, what do you need God's love for? What do you need God's love for? Is it a person? Uh, someone in your family? God, if I'm going to love that person, <laughs> I'm going to need your love. I'm going to need your help. No doubt about it. Maybe it's for somebody at your work. Maybe it's someone in your neighborhood. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's someone at school. Maybe it's even an enemy. And Jesus said that we are supposed to love our enemies. And God, I'm not going to be able to do that without your love. I need your love for this person in this situation. And by the way, one of the greatest demonstrations of, of loving someone and expressing God's love at Christmas is inviting them to come to church, inviting them to hear the good news. Invite people. Do you know that people right now in our country, the biggest time of attendance is Christmas Eve? We will have people who will come to our church that have never come to our church before on Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day because we have a service. There's something within people that want to worship. Use this opportunity. You can say, God, I need your love to be able to witness, to be able to share, to be able to talk to my neighbor because I'm, I'm afraid, I'm frightened. Paul says his love compels us. Get God's love, his spirit within you to compel you that you just have to say, hey, why don't you come to the Christmas Eve service with me? Why don't you come to hear our kids uh, sing next week and stay for lunch? Free lunch, I'll buy you lunch. It's free. You don't have to tell them that, okay? You can be the hero until we say it's free. And then, and then they'll know how cheap you are. Okay, receiving God's love. This morning we're going to receive communion. This is a time for us to remember that he came to die. He loved you so much. He'd rather die than to live without you. He loves you that much. And he loves those who aren't here today. He loves those who are out there. He loves our enemies. We love, he loves those who are trying to hurt our military and our country. He died for them. He died for all. And there will be all nations and every tongue and every tribe that will be in heaven proclaiming the Lord as, as, as king. He loves us. He loves everyone. And he loves you. And so you don't have to be a member of our church to receive communion. You don't have to be a, uh, a, a, a member of the Church of Nazarene. You need to be a member of the family of God. You need to be a member of the family of God. And how do you do that? By asking Jesus Christ to come in your heart and life and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and life. I want to be a child of God. And you were, as you were born physically, you can be born spiritually. Jesus says, unless you're born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of heaven. Forget about going to heaven. Unless you're born again, you're not even going to see the kingdom of heaven. But he died, and he's here, and he's waiting for you to say, Jesus, I want you. I'm tired of going my way. Forgive me of my past. Come into my life today, and I want to enjoy your plans and your purpose for me right now in this life, and I want to enjoy the eternal Father and my Destiny is determined, and you have a place for me in heaven. All that. It's, it's a great bargain. It's a great deal. He loves you. He, he wants you to receive that love. 
So this morning as we receive the, 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 the bread and the cup, and the worship team is coming up, and we'll be singing a song as we distribute the elements. Um, this could be a time that you say, me too, God, I want you. And as we take the bread and as we take the cup, that could be symbolic of you saying, Jesus, come into my life. Wouldn't that be something? And you could become a child of God, born of the Spirit. Pastor Perry is going to lead us in this. And uh, ushers, please come and help us in, re in passing out the elements of communion. <laughs> 